Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Ian Whitaker. I'm the Director of Strategic Content at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, we're excited to partner with WBEZ again. As, as Steve mentioned, there'll be a few slight differences to tonight's show, some small intermissions, some, some musical breaks, perhaps. Um, before we begin, uh, please know we're on the record. We're live streaming this event. Uh, we always welcome social media engagement, but please silence your phones before we begin. Uh, note that views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Um, thank you to our members in attendance today. Your support is, is critical to our work. If you're not a member, please consider joining. Talk to any of our staff. Um, if you're going to our cocktails and conversation mixer, uh, after this program, it's taking place at Free Rain. That's at the St. Jane Hotel, which is formerly the Hard Rock Hotel on, on Michigan Avenue. Um, this discussion will be followed by Q&A. Slightly different tonight, we'll be having a standing mic in the, in the middle aisle there. Um, so you can just line up there with about 20 minutes to go. Um, we'll take questions from in the room. We'll also take them from our app. You can just type chi.cnf.io uh, straight into your browser. Uh, you can ask a question. You can vote on a question. We've already got about five or six questions on the screen. Um, now, very briefly, uh, introducing our, our, our speakers. Ian Bremer is the founder and president of the Eurasia Group, a leading geopolitical risk research and consulting firm. He's also president and founder of G Zero Media. He's, he was the creator of Wall Street's first global political risk index. He's the author of nine books, including Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism, which is available for, for sale and signing this evening from our partners, the bookseller, uh, just over there. And Ian is in conversation with Jerome McDonald, the host of WBZ's long-running global affairs show, Worldview. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ian Bremer and Jerome McDonald. Welcome to Worldview from WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. We're at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs today before a live audience. Nice to see people. We're here to talk with Ian Bremer, and few people are as well equipped to figure out what's going on in this crazy world as Ian Bremer. His Eurasia Group has been doing risk analysis for the last 20 years. His latest book is Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. It is great to have a chat with you, Ian. Good to be with you. I, I wanted to ask before we get into the book, a question about your uh, entertainment uh, philosophy, your communications philosophy. You've got a Twitter feed. Does everybody read Ian's Twitter feed? I think it's the, the preeminent foreign policy Twitter feed. A very small group. <laughs> Let it like be known for book. Radio Land. That was like 5%, basically. <laughs> Every time I talk to somebody about what the ideal Twitter feed for a foreign policy human being is, it, it's yours. It's fantastically entertaining. So, And you've... You've taken this uh, scale now. You created your own media group. You've got G Zero Media Company, and you've got a program uh, that's airing on WTTW here on Friday and Saturday mornings. It's got a puppet show in it. You're you're out there um, trying to talk to people. What's going on? Uh, well, I mean, the first is I've, I've had this company for 20 years, and you don't want me to get bored. So there's that. Um, my, I don't run the company. I, I'm meant to be the face and the expert, the political scientist. Um, I, was, I will say I was very excited this weekend. It's the first time I was ever in a clue in a crossword puzzle. That was that I felt like I got in the Washington Post, like political scientist Bremer. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. But I also have a name that's easy for that, right? But and he put that on his Twitter feed. I did absolutely I saw that. on the Twitter feed. But um, I, I think what happened is I, it felt to me that um, I miss Schoolhouse Rock. Um, it, we don't have it anymore. I remember when I was a kid, that's how I learned things like how a bill became a law. You know, that's how I remembered like what the preamble for the Declaration of Independence was, all this sort of stuff, uh, the Constitution. And um, we don't have it anymore. Instead, we have a whole bunch of people that are watching the news and reading the news and getting increasingly angry. And anyone that follows me on any medium knows that I am not an angry person, right? I, I, I care about politics and I am a political scientist, but I don't take, I take my work very seriously, but I don't take myself that seriously. And I think that that is a better medium to get to particularly young people. And I, I just, and I think that our young people, I don't want them checking out. I, and I, I try to give them something authentic and I want to spend at least a small amount of my time 
trying to make a difference out there. So this is my little way of trying to make a difference. All right. But I hate it when good guests go and start asking the questions. You're, you're taking away a good guest out of the guest pool. I will still be a guest. <laughs> um, let's talk about the book, uh, Us Versus Them. Uh, the way I see it, you've got a kind of contradiction in the book. You start the book out, and it is about things getting worse. Globalization is going to make things work, and uh, the globalists aren't going to do anything about it. Public anger is a chronic condition we've learned to live with because the current system works so well for us. It's punishingly depressing. Then at the end of the book, you say that there is another way, and you lay out all this stuff about a new social contract, and you're uh, jumping up and down about new ideas and, you know, even giving Mark Zuckerberg, cre you know, credit for doing nice things and the possibilities of, uh, uh, you know, people who are serious globalists uh, solving problems. Which is it? Well, I mean, at the bottom of Pandora's box was hope, the, the chest, right? Um, no, th this is, look, anyone that has just lived through this last week knows that the politics are not going in a good direction. And I don't just mean here in the United States. So this was a bad week in the United States too. Uh, anyone that saw what happened with Angela Merkel, who has had to step down today uh, from her role in running uh, the party in Germany, and it's the beginning of the end for her as chancellor, by far the most important leader that we've had in Europe for uh, a couple of decades now. Um, you have, Jair Bolsonaro, who is um, the Trump of the tropics, uh, winning decisively in Brazil. I mean, if you were to go to the next G20 meeting, you will find a number of international leaders who actually assertively embrace Trump's vision. Uh, this is not just about one guy. Um, and uh, I think that that's, uh, the, we have to recognize that, but we also have to recognize that as this is heading in a direction that is dangerous and volatile, uh, that there are going, that we, we usually get the best out of people when they're challenged. We get the best out of people when um, it's required of them. These next years will require it of us. I think we're up to it, but... Um, I have to believe that. But I also think that there are things happening in the world that are fantastic. If I look at, we have, the fact is that over the course of your and my lives, we have watched the world go from one of extreme wealth and extreme poverty to one where most people in the world are kind of part of an emerging global middle class. We've gone from a world, when you and I were kids, where almost all of the things, all the solutions that were required for the world's pressing problems had to come from white men. That's a lot on white men. And over the course of the next 50 years, we're going to have in positions of real authority with true education, we're going to have white women, we're going to have brown men and women, we're going to have, you know, Hispanic men and women, we'll have Asian men and women, that we have a much better shot of fixing everything when it's not just on white men, right? And um, so I, it's hard not to be optimistic about our potential as human beings when we live in a time of greater potential than humanity has ever seen before. All right, but what what about all this stuff in the beginning of the book about the elites, you know, being too comfortable and not really doing getting on it? Because the wheels of the political system right now are actually falling off, right? I mean, we have a and this is what the book is about fundamentally that there are an increasingly large percentage of people in democracies around the world, starting in wealthy democracies, but increasingly, and I said this in the book, in emerging markets too who believe the system is rigged against them with fairly good reason, and they are increasingly articulating that belief in ways that are fundamentally problematic to continuing to run those democracies. So on the one hand, the United States globally is now increasingly being muscled by a country with a completely different system, an authoritarian and state capitalist system that is a true economic and technological superpower, China, they're not just sitting quietly. They're not just saying we're poor. They're saying we're going to build an alternative system that will be a competitor to you. But at the same time that that is happening geopolitically, within the United States and within democracies all over the world, we actually have a whole bunch. The momentum, the political momentum is not with pro-globalism. 
not with open markets, not with open borders, but is instead is with nationalism. Instead is with anti-establishment. This system doesn't work. And that is, uh, frankly, being hit from both sides is for someone who spent his life at believing that open borders and free trade was the way to go, that's a very challenging environment. It's one that's really going to hurt. Talk with, talk to me about walls, because you uh, are you talk about walls in a way that scares me, that you, you think walls work, and you think that people putting up walls is something that uh, is an effective thing for the authoritarian types that are out there. And it's something we might be uh, seeing a lot more of. You, you paint a kind of dark picture there. Absolutely. Uh, th this is the one thing that I think needs um, from the book that is, is most controversial and probably is least widely accepted. Uh, the first point is that we've believed for a long time that as China got wealthier, they would politically reform or they would fail. That's wrong. And one reason why it is wrong, there are many, but one reason why it's wrong is because technology, and particularly the data revolution, the surveillance revolution, empowers authoritarian regimes. So the Chinese and their ability to use big data and surveillance to ensure political stability without reforming and to export that to countries like Zimbabwe and Pakistan and say that we're going to actually give you the infrastructure to build your own surveillance states, and it's working, right? So that's that's one reason why walls work, is that if you are Uyghur in China today, there's a million of you that are sitting in re-education camps, yep. and the, the threat of demonstrations against the Chinese regime is a lot less because of their control of data, which allows them to build more effective walls of people that they like from people that they don't like. But also in liberal democracies, we're building more effective walls. I mean, President Trump is extraordinary at determining who's for him and who's against him, right? And that's how he won, and that's how he's built his brand. But it's not just there. I mean, there are a lot of countries. I look at Israel, and I think of Israel as one of the most effective advanced industrial democracies in the world. It is open media, robust it's an independent judiciary and rule of law. It's not corrupt, right? It's a great educational system, great infrastructure. Um, and that's even true for Arabs that live in Israel. It's only not true for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And now, by the way, there are a lot of reasons why Palestinians, the West Bank, and Gaza aren't doing well. Some of it is divisions in their own governance and the rest. Some of it is not much support from the Arabs or the Europeans or the Americans historically. Like, don't just blame the Israelis for that. But the point is that you used to have Tom Friedman writing that if Israel did not have a two-state solution for the Palestinians, they would fail. Again, not true. The ability of the Israelis to fundamentally wall off the Palestinians using security and surveillance is vastly greater now than it has been historically. And by the way, there are lots of other countries in the world that are learning from that to allow for much greater levels of social inequality that are sustainable. You talked about um, how many walls are being built in Europe right now. We don't think about Europe. We think of Europe as bringing down the walls and uh, uh, free movement of people, but they're throwing up walls just as fast as they can, and it works for a lot of those guys. Uh, the Italian, the new Italian government won largely on the back of anti-immigration sentiment, also um, for um, anti-Europe sentiment, certainly you see that um, with the weakness of Macron right now in France and the broader support that the communists and the National Front has received. The Brexit vote was a vote for more walls. Um, Merkel's loss uh, in Hesse and as well as in Bavaria a couple weeks ago was a loss on the back of allowing in all of these migrants. The Europeans are looking for more walls. Uh, a lo look, Americans, we understand that our educational system is radically underperforming, particularly in the early stages compared to other advanced industrial democracies. But all of us are really good of ensuring that no matter how bad the educational system is, that we make sure that our kids get into good schools, 
that our kids are in the right place, that they have the right opportunities. And as long as we are doing that, we're just not going to prioritize the money that needs to be spent on really improving the educational system for the country as a whole. We're doing a better job of building walls inside the United States too. Someone asked me earlier today, they said, what about the humanitarian crisis in Chicago of guns? And I'm like, I don't know about you, but I was in Lincoln Park last night. It felt okay, right? <laughs> There didn't seem to be a humanitarian crisis of guns in Chicago. Now, in other parts of Chicago, absolutely, but I don't go there, so it's fine. So we don't need to do anything about it, right? We're very good at walls and we're segregation. Very, we're very we're, good at that. We're getting, the point is we're getting much better at it. And, you know, I, I just think it's you can't presume that we're going to be forced by crisis to knock these walls down when actually everything we're learning is that it's getting a lot easier and more sustainable to build them. I'm Jerome McDonald talking with Ian Bremmer. We're talking about some of the ideas in his book, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. We are at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. The thing about the walls issue before we leave it is um, you talk about how we have to dehumanize the other to, to build the wall. And th that's the ugly part, uh, if it can get more ugly, of this whole scenario. You've got everybody dehumanizing everybody else instead of this um, happy world of globalized leaders where we're participating with more than white men. We're actually doing the opposite. Yes. Uh, and again, not only in the United States. I mean, Bolsonaro won on the back of some of the most vicious anti-female diatribe um, anti-gay, anti-black. Um, certainly, if you look at Trump in the United States, talking about Mexicans as you know raping and criminalizing in the United States, um, the the Muslim ban that he wanted to put in place, the Middle Easterners that have infiltrated the caravan, um, the uh, Nigerians that will never go back to living in their huts if we um, allow them to come to the United States, the Haitians that are bringing AIDS to America, the black athletes um, that that dare to kneel during our national anthem after we allow them to make millions of dollars in the National Football League, those are very powerful dehumanizing messages that work. And they work particularly for large numbers of Americans who feel like they have been ignored for decades and no one is taking care of them. So that us versus them message, which worked for Brexit, and it worked across the continental Europe. It's working in Brazil. It's working in the United States. There's only one major democracy that it's really not working, and that's Japan. And Japan is really interesting, right? Where you have none of this populism, none of this us versus them. You know why? Well, number one, because there ain't no them. No immigrants in Japan, right? It's all Japanese. They like hate one guy named George, but generally speaking, like it's all good. Number two, population is shrinking. All right, so per capita, even though Japan's not growing, per capita, actually, the average Japanese worker is doing a lot better than they were 25 years ago compared to any other advanced industrial economy. Number three, they don't fight in wars. They're constitutionally forbidden from doing so, which means that you don't have the enlisted men and women in their families. You go to any town in the U.S. where there's a military base, you'll see a lot of people that like Trump, a lot of people that like Bernie Sanders, not a lot of people that like the political establishment because they've been sent to fight in these failed wars, not the wealthy people, right? And then finally, almost no social media in Japan. By far less social media for the adults than any other advanced industrial democracy, which means you don't have that incredible polarization that we find on Twitter and Facebook and the rest, which is so damaging to civic values and our democracy. But of course, that's okay because those CEOs are just trying to maximize short-term shareholder return. They're not meant to be patriotic, nor are they effectively regulated, but it hurts our country, right? So what are we gonna do to these companies that are effectively tobacco companies that are trying to sell addiction that makes money but hurts our country? And we do not have an answer for that. Right, and so th there's no question. You asked at the beginning why the book is so depressing at the opening, <laughs> yeah. and those are the reasons there, because the structural reasons, not because Trump is a symptom. Trump's not the reason why this happened. All right, so what's the counter narrative to all this dehumanization and um, walls and all the rest? What is there a effective argument 
that um, you know we're going to we're going to have an economic system that really is inclusive, and the guys from Google are going to get together with the guys from Facebook, and we're all going to have a happy uh, scenario. It, Hillary, that doesn't Hillary sound... Clinton is the answer. <laughs> If we just had her as president, none of this would have happened, right? <laughs> Why is it nervous laughter, right? <laughs> no, this is the thing, right? No, cl clearly Trump is making it worse. I mean, I would never say he wasn't making it worse. He knows what he's doing. But the point is, it's not about one individual leader. We've been heading down this path for decades, and it's not just about the US, it's about all these other countries. So clearly it has to be something broader than just someone we elected in the United States. So what are we going to do about it? What's the counter narrative? Well, the counter narrative is you have to actually make the people that feel disenfranchised, make the people that feel the system is rigged against them, feel like the system is no longer rigged against them. Now, by the way, part of that is somehow regulating maybe like utilities or like proper media companies, these social media firms. You do have to start there because fake news and bots and weaponizing extremist information for the purposes of maximizing eyeballs must stop if we want to address this issue. That is a problem, right? When you see that the executives from Google and Facebook and Twitter actually refuse to allow their children on these phones and these devices themselves, right? Like all of them, right? That should tell you that there is something truly nefarious about the business model, right? That it, it needs to stop. Um, but it's not just that. It's that the social contract has to actually be adjusted. That, you know, you have to take these people whose jobs are being displaced by automation and AI. And yes, maybe there are lots of new jobs, but these people are not going to be trained to have them. You have to give them some belief in their future. We have racism in this country. I'm not, I'm not apologizing for it. We've had racism for a long time. But somehow racism has become much more weaponized in the last few years. And we have to understand that what's happening in this country right now is not just about racism. It's about what the processes are that weaponized racism. And, and those are the things we're talking about in this book. I'm talking with Ian Bremmer. He's the author of Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. And he is also uh, the head of the Eurasia Group, where he's been doing risk analysis for 20 years. We're going to be back with more after the break. I'm Jerome McDonald. We're here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And this is Worldview. This is Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. I'm talking with Ian Bremmer today. He's the author of Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism, and we're at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I wanted to ask you a question about when you're talking about globalism, it seems like sometimes you're talking about inequality. And you describe yourself as, as a guy from the projects in the book and uh, somebody who is... You know, you know, relatable to the every man, and uh, is is inequality a bigger deal than your book makes it out to be? Is it um, really a driver where globalism is kind of a dodge word for for massive inequality? Um, so when I complain about globalism, it's not globalization, right? Globalization is this economic process of open borders trade and goods and ideas and people moving all over the world faster and faster, and that has indeed created extraordinary global wealth. Globalism, not the alt-right use of globalism as code for Soros and Jews, but globalism as, is an idea, it's a Western ideology that open borders and free trade and all the rest will be good for everyone in our societies. 
That's the neoliberal model. That's what got you the European Union and the Eurozone. Let's make this happen at a supranational level. Let's give away a level of sovereignty to these institutions to ensure that we can all grow. Now, that has worked really well for a small number of elites in the West. But globalism has not worked for a significant number, maybe even a majority, of citizens in the advanced industrial democracies. And so I don't think that's just code for inequality. That is an entire political system that people, elites, people like me, have been promoting for decades. And Donald Trump last week said, I'm a nationalist. I reject globalism, right? That's a pretty dramatic statement. In other words, I reject open and free trade and open and free borders and the United States as the world's policeman and America as the cheerleader of liberal democratic values. I reject those things because they haven't worked for the average American that's voting for me. That's a powerful statement that, you know, frankly, even if Trump does not have the tools to address those problems, at least he's saying he's willing to break some of the China. And there are, and I mean that, I guess, quite literally in addition to uh, <laughs> not. Um, but, you know, the fact is there are a lot of people out there that were willing to vote for anyone as a protest. In the same way that Palestinians are willing to throw rocks or throw themselves at the Gaza border vis-a-vis -vis Israel when they know that the Israeli Defense Forces have shoot to kill for people that are trying to breach, but they're doing it because it expresses their level of frustration with 50% unemployment in Gaza. And, and no one that cares about them, including their own government, by the way. So no one, their own is Palestinian government. So no one is helping them. And I, I think that the average vote for Trump or the average vote for Brexit, when I'm on CNN and they're saying, but he lies all the time, this reminds me of when I used to read the National Enquirer as a kid, which my mother used to bring home in the projects. And, and by the way, it's a good way to learn how to read the National Enquirer because the words are not that challenging, right? Um, but I, you know, the fact is the National Enquirer had a deeper truth. The deeper truth, it had all these crazy facts and crazy headlines. Sometimes they get it right, like Tiger Woods, for example, and Senator Edwards, but usually they're wrong. But the, but the deeper truth, I know, you read that one, right? But the, deep, the deeper truth, the deeper truth was that all of those people with the money are lying to you, and they don't care about you, and they're not going to take care of you. And my mother bought that. She really did. And if she was still alive today, she would have voted for Trump. Maybe for Sanders, certainly not for anyone in the establishment, right? And I, I think, and and all of those kids from the projects I grew up with, who are still there, are angry because they believe that they were fed a line about the American dream. And one thing that I have said a couple times publicly, which I want to say to the audience tonight, is those of you that do follow me probably will notice that I do not criticize Trump nearly as often as most people out there that cover foreign policy. And part of the reason for that, sometimes it's because I actually think he's on the right side of an issue, like North Korea, for example, which we can talk about if you like. But most of the time, it's because I personally feel a level of complicity with the system that allowed Trump to become president. And I think it's important to address that complicity as opposed to just saying, I think we need to get rid of this guy. Because if you don't address the root causes, you're not actually solving the problem at all. That's why I don't do it. I wanted to get you to talk a bit about artificial intelligence and technology. And yeah, throughout the book, you're talking about it as a thing that is going to steal enormous amounts of jobs from everybody on the planet. It's um, going to be a transformational situation. Uh, what, what do we have to do to get a grip on what is happening to us with technology? Um, so I, right now hold two mutually incompatible ideas in my head about technology. The first I've already shared with you, which is that these companies are basically treating us as the product, they're dangerous to American democracy and Western democracy, and they need to have their business models changed. Uh, and since government is not doing it, maybe it needs to be act holder, share, shareholder activists, things like that. On the other hand, I look at those same companies 
the Googles and the Amazons and the Facebooks and the rest. And I say they are actually the most strategically important for American national security for the next 10 to 20 years. That the alternative to them are Chinese companies like Alibaba and Tencent, which are being actively promoted as national mon monopolies by the Chinese government. And that we need, as the US government, to actively promote the strength of these companies or the Chinese are gonna win in AI, which is unacceptable because we don't want the Chinese model to run global governance. That would be bad for everybody, in my view. Um, and we need to treat these companies the way we treated Lockheed or Raytheon or Northrop when we were fighting against the Soviets. Now, I honestly believe both of those things, and I have no idea what to do about it. At the very least, so I just wrote a piece with Nick Thompson, who's the editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine. It just came out a couple days ago. If you haven't taken a look at it and you care about this issue, take a look at it. He's also a former student of mine for Stanford. I, I love the guy. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And, uh, but he knows the, the, the AI side, and I know the geopolitics side, so that's why we wrote it together. And we wrote the piece in the, – the biggest reason we wrote the piece is that we wanted to then, which we did, we did this just today, we sent it to every senator and member of the House of Representatives that I know, about 50 in all, and based, sent them a piece with a cover letter saying, you need to understand this issue – and there need to be hearings in Washington about what to do about it. So we can at least kick off the conversation. So a lot more resources can be put on this issue by smart people as opposed to me standing up in front of the crowd saying, I see these two mutually incompatible things that I don't know what we should do. But I do think it's really important for people like me to be honest with you when we don't know the answer to something. It's really important to understand when things are really challenging and there are tensions and we don't know what to do. It's like the Saudi Arabia thing, right? Like there are honest to God tensions between having a good relationship with Saudi Arabia, who we should like today more than Iran for many reasons, and, and yet the fact that like having the present relationship we do is clearly corrosive for a bunch of the values that we actually care about as a country and as a nation. Right? And being honest about the tension, as opposed to just yelling at each other with headlines, would be a much more useful way. We need to have more nuance. We need to actually have discussions, preferably face-to-face. -face, right? Again, a reason why the way we presently engage in trying to purvey information is not really healthy for the country. Can you give us some idea about the, the, the volume of change you see coming with artificial intelligence? Because you... Um scare the wits out of me a little bit in the book. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, like India's gonna lose half its jobs, things like that. Well, I mean, there may be a lot more jobs again. I will tell you that right now, we are living in an environment where um, we have almost full employment in the United States. Global growth is almost gonna be 4% this year, as well as next year. That feels pretty good. And yet, I mean, I talk to a lot of CEOs in the United States, a lot of CEOs that run the big multinational companies. And I will tell you that to a man, and they're almost all men, um, they believe that they can make a lot more money in the next 10 years with fewer people. And that is true for banking, that is true for manufacturing, that is true for insurance, that is true for, I mean, al almost everyone but high tech and even some of the high tech folks, right? Almost everyone. Uh, it, you know, Lord knows, I mean, it's true for like, you know, the transportation and all the rest. Um, I, that means to me, so people now look at the global marketplace and they say, well, you, you, there are all these geopolitical risks out there, They're massive geopolitical concerns. We see them every day. And yet the markets are doing really well. How come? And I say, well, because the economy is doing well and we can kick the can down the road on a lot of this stuff. But the next recession that hits, when suddenly we don't have the resilience in the political institutions that we had after the last re uh, uh, re recession in 2008, and when all of the CEOs suddenly are saying, oh, we need to actually tighten our belt so we're going to let a lot of people go, then we have a problem. So I think that the consequence of a lot of the volatility that we're talking about geopolitically that's coming right now, we will not experience until the next economic downturn. And then the, it will actually have much greater consequence than we otherwise would have expected. That's the way I would think about it. Uh, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, and you have been a fan of Mohammed bin Salman's reform efforts. And you uh, mentioned you think it's better to be friends with Saudi Arabia than, than with Iran. 
Uh, do we have to reevaluate that whole thing now? Uh, and the war in Yemen is a, would be a great thing to stop. It seems like uh, he started that. He's he's had a lot, he's had a pretty bad track record, actually. If you uh, look at it pretty closely, uh, why do we have to change? our relationship with Saudi Arabia. So, uh, first of all, when Trump came out right at the beginning after the Khashoggi murder and said, "Look, I mean, I don't want to I don't want to talk about a 100 billion, you know, sort of in, in the arms deal because otherwise other countries are going to do that." By the way, Macron, and we all know that Macron is the poster child for, you know, globalization and globalism, came out and said, "Well, I mean, it would be pure demagoguery for me not to continue to sell all the weapons we send sell to the Saudis. I mean, Trump is absolutely right that if we don't sell those weapons to Saudi Arabia, other countries are coming right in and selling them. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that we should still sell them, but we should be honest about that. We should understand the cost. I also think it is worth understanding that even though the Saudis are better friends to us than Iran, and that makes sense to me for reasons we can talk about if you like, we should also understand that the asymmetry in the Saudi-U.S. relationship, like they need us a little more than we need them, right? Now, when we have a president like Trump who is more than happy to kick the living crap out of the Canadians, right, because they are taking advantage of us well, on dairy production <laughs> or – the Mexicans who are sending over all the immigrants or the Japanese because they're not spending enough on their own defense. They don't buy Buicks, right? Or the Europeans because, you know, God forbid they don't want to buy our SUVs even though their gas costs like $10 a gallon, right? Um, you would think he'd be able to kick the Saudis around a little more, right? So, I mean, I do think that if you want to have a president that's going to play hardball with the allies to get better deals for the U.S., let's do that. I mean, Israel would also be an interesting place to talk about asymmetries in relationship, even though I think Israel's a very good friend of the United States. But still, if you're going to have a president that's going to do that, then do it. Um, I also think that the Saudis, um, Mohammed bin Salman, I have absolutely praised him as an economic reformer, as a social reformer, as a religious reformer. He's taken the religious police off the streets. He's actually really reduced their ambit to, 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 to determine outcomes so that women living in Saudi Arabia, their lives are much less horrible than they were before MBS became crown prince. But let's be clear. He is not in any way, he's opening cinemas and he's investing in sport and giving Saudi young people something to do. And you could say, well, cinemas, who cares? The fact is that not having anything to do in Saudi Arabia is really one of the reasons we have radicalism, right? So that's important. But he is not a political reformer, right? Like, not at all. In fact, any criticism of Mohammed bin Salman will get you in a lot of trouble. Or if you're Mr. Khashoggi, will get you killed. And, and absolutely, I think it's unfortunate that one of the principal results of the Khashoggi murder which was covered overwhelmingly more than all of the murders in Yemen that occur, the civilian deaths and the starvation and the rest, because Khashoggi happens to be well-known to a lot of Washington newsmakers who also happen to hate Trump, right? So that's why it made so much news. I understand that. I get it, but let's recognize that. But the fact is that what's going to happen is the U.S. still going to have a good relationship with Saudi Arabia. That's not really going to change. What's going to change is that Mohammed bin Salman has been weakened internally so that the reforms that he's been engaging in I would no longer bet on. I would actually say they are going because they've been really unpopular with a lot of the hardliners and conservatives in Saudi Arabia. So the Saudi, my outlook on Saudi Arabia now is higher because of $85 oil, but it's lower because the reform process, which was already a tall order, is probably not going to get done. So now, I don't know how many of you agree with all of that. That's kind of not the point. It's a very nuanced conversation. There, this is not a black or white issue at all, but it's hard to have that conversation it's impossible on Twitter, and it's hard to have that conversation on cable news, right? And so that's one of the reasons I like doing stuff like this. Well, uh, should we have a more balanced relationship with countries in the Middle East? Um, why not have a better relationship with Iran? It seems like it'd be more fun to be a, a young person in Iran than it would be in Saudi Arabia, 
it seems like they're going to manage their future a little more better for people than, than people in Saudi Arabia. So I was uh, all in favor, well, I was 90% in favor of the Iranian nuclear deal, but let us recognize um, that the Iranians um, actually do pose a significant direct security threat to Israel. The Iranians are actually uh, governed by a theocracy, which is deeply problematic um, in terms of basic human rights, treatment of homosexuality, um, you know, sort of certainly treatment of open and free media. You saw the brutal repression after the Green Revolution, basic demonstrations in Iran. Their economy is not doing very well. It's massively corrupt. They do have a large population. I mean, you know, you look at 90 million people that are potentially a marketplace. That's a lot more interesting to sell to than 30 million in Saudi Arabia. We're the largest oil producer right now. Oil from Saudi still matters a lot, but doesn't matter as much to us as it did 10 years ago. I think the broader question is, number one, should the United States be spending anywhere near the amount of effort on the Middle East today that we did 10, 20, 30 years ago? And the answer to that probably is no. We should probably have less engagement with the Middle East than we have historically, much more in Asia. We can't do everything. Then you have the second question of um, should American policy in the Middle East be more Chinese? Chinese policy doesn't care about human rights, doesn't care about what the regimes are like. The Chinese, are they gonna work with the Iranians? work with the Saudis, work with the Qataris, does not matter. I actually think that U.S. policy should care more about alignment of values, interests, national security, sharing intelligence, where the Chinese have a much more mercantile policy towards all these countries. But reasonable people disagree on that issue, including some that you've had on this stage recently. So um, I think that's an interesting place to debate. Uh, it, but let's be clear that the nuclear deal with Iran, while it allowed for the potential to engage more with the Iranians, absolutely did not make them friends compared to the Saudis. Under Obama, we still had very serious sanctions against Iran. That nuclear deal involved their ability to develop nuclear research and spin centrifuges. Didn't involve their ballistic missile development, which they're under sanction for from the United Nations, and they breached those sanctions did not involve their support for Hezbollah and other organizations we consider to be terrorists in the United States. Those things are still very relevant. Towards the end of the book, when you're talking about a new social contract, you do uh, try to uh, discuss innovation in an optimistic way. And one of the questions that was up on the board here was, give me some optimism. And it, it was, uh, you think people can innovate and create and do interesting things that can get us out of our problems. Uh, yeah, I just think it's going to take time. Um, I, I think that right now you have people in the United... So when, when Trump pulled out of Paris Climate Accord, which uh, the Brazilians might have also said they will probably do the new Brazilian president, um, let's face it, every other country at that point in the world, every other country disagreed with us. It is hard to actually promote a policy that every other country disagrees with. So that, that's impressive in some ways, right? Um, they... Um, the fact is that a whole, over 200 mayors, a lot of governors, CEOs across the board in the United States all came back and said, we're still going to stick with at least Paris numbers, which Mike Bloomberg organizes this big meeting, Bill Gates, others show up, they go to Paris and they say, we're still sticking with this. The ability of people outside of Washington to make a difference in innovation when things are not working in Washington is something that we should really believe in in the United States. I see experiments on universal basic income. I'm not a big believer of it, but the data is still out. We don't know yet. So let's, people are trying that stock in California. It's an experiment. Let's see if it works. There are experiments in universal lifetime training. AT&T is putting one in place right now, for example. There are experiments in the gig economy and changing social safety net in other parts of the world. I think that in the same way that when climate change started to become known by the scientific community as a long-term threat. We didn't know what the answers were. Today, we know that one of the answers is solar power because we've now done enough investing in solar to understand that you can actually do solar at scale and it's cheaper than coal during the daytime. That's awesome. We don't yet know what the solutions are to these problems that you're asking me about at scale. So we need to start investing in lots of experiments. And I think that's a good thing to do. 
Ian Bremmer is the author of Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. We'll be back with more after the break. We'll take some questions here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I'm Jerome McDonald, and you're listening to Worldview on WBEZ. So if, um, if uh, anyone who has a question could line up behind the young lady standing there in the middle. And we're going to take about 15 minutes or so to get in your questions. Okay. This is Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. I'm here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs with Ian Bremmer. We're talking about his book, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. And we're going to take some questions from the audience. And uh, ma'am, nice to see you. Thank you so much. Um, earlier in the conversation, you talked about how authoritarianism is on the rise. And some of these governments are further enabled by these new technology. Eurasia Group counts as many of its clients these authoritarian governments as well as these uh, techno no, technological firms. Um, can you say on the record that um, the Eurasia Group does not work with any authoritarian government or companies based in authoritarian yeah. regimes? Yeah, yeah. Where, where did you get that information from? Because it's wrong. Um, that, that is an, and that is an interesting information. So um, in that context, if you could... Um, if you could comment. You're starting with fake news. That's, I mean, it's very 21st century, but still, it's kind of interesting. Um, so, so in this context, since Eurasia Group does not work with any companies um, in China or in the U.S. that contribute to surveillance technology or other types of technology, uh, can you just comment overall as the father of um, political risk consultancy? Uh, do you see there is a moral obligation, or do you see your work as morally neutral? Thank you. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, it's something that I've thought about a lot as the owner of the firm, as the founder of the firm. Um, number one, I mean, if you're going to write about China, if you start taking money from the government or from companies that are owned uh, or are national champions of China, and you write something about China that they don't like, they will pressure you to write something different about them um, or you'll lose them as a client. Um, I remember we once worked with um, a part of the UAE government, uh, and um, this was years ago, and it was a strategy office, and uh, we wrote, and because I, my view was that they had become much more transparent, a la Singapore, and they didn't like something that one of our analysts wrote on the UAE. They came, someone complained to me, and I was like, uh, no, you don't get to actually make that. They, they no longer, they left as a client as a consequence, and they didn't pay us for the six months that they owed us, which I was kind of pissed about. So I actually wrote in a note to clients that we weren't working that anymore, and they didn't pay us, and here's why, which I thought was great for our brand. Um, I remember, you, some of you might remember Dan Jurgen, uh, who I adore, by the way. Dan Jurgen was one of the founders of, he wrote the book The Prize on oil and energy, and he started a firm that was kind of a, a model for me starting your age group called Cambridge Energy Research Associates, Sarah, and they have something called Sarah Week. He sold it since. And but I and so he started this thing from scratch and had what I he built for global energy I wanted to build for political science, but then I start I found out that he was I, I used to work on the former Soviet Union I speak Russian, and I saw that some of the research that he was doing on Baku Jehan was suddenly becoming really biased his company and then I found out that they were taking money from Luke Oil and it was one of their biggest clients. It was like over a million dollars. This was in the 90s. And it completely destroyed their credibility on that issue. So, I mean, I, you have to make a trade-off as to whether you think that the money that you make from clients is worth systematically undermining the independence of your research because you just can't develop walls um, in that way. Those walls will will affect the quality. But again, I would, I would just suggest to you, because you asked a public question in front of a lot of people, it probably undermines your credibility 
if you don't do research on something like that and at least say where you got it from um, as opposed to making the allegation that's wrong. And then, I, I mean, it's fun for me because I get to describe it to everybody, but I think it'd be better for you next time to get it right. Um, now, um, I wanted to ask a question about China, and there, there was an interesting question on the board here uh, about uh, whether you'd like to be the leader of uh, the United States, China, or Russia, and why. Um, is, any, is one of these countries better off than the other? Is, is one of them strategically in a good place? Oh, the U.S. is in a much better place. Because geopolitically, we are in a much more peaceful part of the world. We are the largest food producer. We're the largest energy producer. We have the most entrepreneurship. The demographics look reasonably good. I mean, and, and the political institutions are much stronger. They're much more resilient. But if you asked me honestly which country I think I would rather run of the three, I think I would say Russia. And the reason I think I would say that, aside from the fact that I speak the language, which makes it easier, because the Chinese thing would be hard for me, you know. You speak English, too. I speak English, too. No, but I say Russia because I think I could make more of a difference, because Russia, the system has so much opportunity, and it's been so destroyed by the kleptocracy around one man, that I kind of think coming in running Russia, you could actually meaningfully change the lives in a positive way of a lot of people. They're systematically not investing in people anymore. I mean, back in, when the Soviet Union collapsed, you had companies like Boeing and Sun Microsystems that went in to hire all of these scientists because they were underpaid, but really good. And they've just crushed their STEM investment. They've crushed their investment in culture. And I, I just think that you know, someone who actually really cared about the Russian people in a relatively short period of time would be able to put the country in a radically different trajectory, which would make a real difference and make the world a much less dangerous place. Where the average American president, either Trump or Obama, at the end of the day, after four or eight years, you don't get to move the needle that much, right? You're really constrained by the deep bureaucracy, by separation and balance of powers. You can't do many things that are positive, but you also can't do many things, thank God, to really tear the system apart. So in that regard, I think I'd probably pick Russia. So you're saying that the United States and China need too much structural reform to fix, and, and, and Russia doesn't. I think there's a very, no, no, Russia needs a lot of structural reform, but I think that the, the political system is such, the institutions are so weak, that actually one individual can really move it, where the situation, the, uh, the institutions are much more stultified um, in, in the US and China. But I do think that there's a very interesting question related to what you just said, which is, which country is in greater need of structural political reform today, the US or China? I have to say that for my entire lifetime, it's so obvious that the answer has been China. And I think today, it's harder to say that. Uh, no one in the foreign policy establishment in Washington would agree with that statement. They'd all say, well, are you kidding me? Of course it's China. But the reality is there are things about the American system, political system, that are clearly very deeply broken in terms of serving the American people. And I think if you go and ask which political system needs more reform, if you go to Canada, you go to Germany, you go to the Philippines, you go to Brazil, and you ask the average person in those countries, the U.S. or China, they would say that's an interesting debate. We need to be aware of that as Americans. We really do. Let's take a question. Uh, really quick, how does sovereign debt and the level of our debt limit our ability to do anything with some of these people who we owe a lot of money to but we don't want to deal with? And then in terms of how the pendulum swings from far right to far left and in between, how short of a world war do you get it to kind of stop in the middle? Yeah, uh, the, la the second question's harder. Um, the first question, I'm someone who does not necessarily have a problem with high levels of debt. Because, look, if we look at corporations, we decide to invest in a corporation or not, not just on the basis of their debt, but also their assets. We look at the entire balance sheet. And somehow when we look at sovereigns, we don't look at assets anymore, which I think is, doesn't make sense, right? Like, I mean, if, if the United States wants to do deficit spending, but we invest in things that will actually improve the asset base of the country long term, like education and infrastructure. I'm all in favor of that. So when Trump wanted to do a trillion dollars of deficit spending, deficit spending, right, just more debt, um, but into infrastructure, I would have supported that completely, especially when interest rates are low, all over it. Um, now, you know, we're not going to do it. 
right? And the fact that we can't invest in long-term infrastructure in the U.S. while the Chinese can, even though theirs is very inefficient and frequently breaks quickly, is a problem we have in our system. But I don't necessarily believe that indebtedness by itself is the problem the United States has. I believe that indebtedness coupled with things like no longer attracting the same levels of best and brightest from all over the world to our universities and not keeping them here once we have them here, that's a mistake. Um, the idea that we're suddenly scaring away bureaucrats that have worked in the Department of State and the DOJ and Treasury for their entire lives and suddenly they're fleeing and new ones don't want to come in, like it's happening in Mexico too now as well, not just the United States, that's a huge mistake, right? So we're, we're doing a lot of things now that are really eating seed corn that I, I make me worried about the next generation in the United States. But the indebtedness by itself is not that thing. Um, you're absolutely right that this, if we get stuck in the middle of the pendulum between systems, old US-led order doesn't work anymore, but there isn't a new order yet, that's when um, you're in greatest danger of major geopolitical confrontation. And we are entering that geopolitical recession Right now, when we had the economic recession in 2008, everyone was worried about a depression. So everyone got together and said, let's make sure we do bailouts, we do stimulus, we try to build consumer confidence, and we're seen as prioritizing this together. We're in a geopolitical recession in 2018, but you get the G7, the G20 together, countries are not saying, hey, we need to avoid war. They're not. In fact, you know, populations are leaning more into nationalist responses. So it, I don't think we're heading for World War III. I really don't. But only a fool would look at this geopolitical environment and say it's not becoming more dangerous than it was. It's obviously becoming more dangerous. I'm talking with Ian Bremmer. We're talking about some of the issues in us versus them, the failure of globalism, and taking some questions here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Ma'am. Uh, do you have an opinion on how the opioid crisis in the United States fits in all of this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, when you think about not investing in infrastructure, you also are talking about not investing in proper health care. The United States spends an enormous amount of money on health care, more than per capita than any other advanced industrial democracy, and we get very little return from that. Um, and the opioid crisis is a part of that. I, I was all in favor of Obama's universal health care. I think that that strikes me as some kind of basic human right, especially in a country that can afford it. Um, but at no point did he try to address the cost base. At no point did he try to go after the AARP or after Big Pharma, try to ensure that you could actually focus health care on sustainable delivery and not provide unsustainable levels of coverage of experimental treatments for, you know, sort of Americans in, in the tail end of life. And as much as I'd like to be able to give everything to everyone, that was irresponsible. Um, and again, I'm not suggesting Trump has a better solution, but we, we've got a problem here. And the opioid crisis is part of that problem. It's, it's an American political system that is not doing a good job of investing in the long term for our citizens. I mean, the, the fact is that you've got a German government that is much better at addressing pensions and fiscal spending as their demographics change. It's lockstep. That would be useful in the United States, not doable. It seems like an obvious thing. Like if you're living longer, you should be just, you should just be shifting your pension and shifting what you spend on the basis of how you're actually doing. That's the way a normal company would actually respond to these challenges. But the US government, far too much money in our political system, far too much influence for special interests on both sides of the aisle, far um, too long uh, electoral cycles with elections that happen all the time, very limited window for governance on a very small number of issues, and we are, as Americans, paying the cost of that. Sir, next question. Do you believe that in the medium term, de-dollarization or a decline in like foreign demand for US dollars is a real threat, or is that fake news promoted by fear mongers? I think it's a long-term threat, not a medium-term threat. Um, I think in the short to medium term, the fact that the United States is so obviously the cleanest dirty shirt in a geopolitical environment that gets more dangerous, we have, I mean, the U.S. does not have a refugee crisis. The U.S. does not have an external terrorism crisis, right, the way that lots of other countries do. We don't have an arms race on our borders, right? We're not facing Venezuela tomorrow. We're not facing, like, you know, sort of China versus India. None of these things. And in that environment, I think the dollar looks strong. It's also still the world's largest e uh, economy. The Chinese RMB is not convertible. And the Eurozone is getting weaker and actually more divergent, not stronger. 
Now, uh, and crypto, if it ever truly became big enough to be a threat to sovereigns, it would be regulated into a much smaller space. So I think the near to medium term, I don't see that. But long term, certainly as China becomes the world's largest economy and as the technology space globally fragments, which I think is what we're on track for, long term, I do think that de-dollarization becomes more important. And if you read people like Eichengreen, they'll tell you the hit on the American economy of that is probably about 30%. Now, if that happened all at once, it would be a depression. If that plays out gradually over one or two generations, then it's noticeable as a drag, but it's not necessarily considered a disaster, right? So that's the way I think about it. Ma'am, your question. Going back to touch on the automi auto the automation of jobs within the US, do you see the robot tax as a viable solution to this problem? Um, I think I would rather see a tax um, that, um, generally speaking, whether it's a value-added tax or a tax on all corporate profits, than I would specifically on a robot tax, um, because I don't necessarily want um, to see robots versus workers determining inefficiency of labor. I'd rather see efficiency of labor and production and then take the money and put it in the most efficient way towards the kind of programs that we actually want. So, I mean, if a robot tax is the way that you can get something done in one constituency in one country, it could be a partial solution, but I suspect it's an inefficient one. Ma'am, your question. <clears throat> Hi, um, I have a question that uh, revolves around uh, the Khashoggi murder. Um, after the murder, a lot of people were concerned about uh, the arms deal um, with Saudi Arabia, and one of the undercurrents seemed to be um, Saudi Arabia pulling investments if we press too hard on the country uh, in response to the murder. And I'm just wondering, what what is the weight of that threat? I mean, a country threatens to pull their investments, what what kind of timeline are they even a, capable of doing, and and just how serious of a threat is, is that for Saudi Arabia and for other countries uh, to implement? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I really, going back to my point, I think that the Saudi-U.S. relationship is a much more asymmetric and imbalanced one. They're a country of 30 million people. The U.S. is a country of uh, some 400 million um, the, the economic size is vastly different. The Saudis need the U.S. for lots of reasons. The Americans were not going to cut off all those reasons. I, I do think it would be useful. The American influence over the Yemen war and its outcomes, which the U.N. now says is the worst, single worst humanitarian crisis in the world, the major lever you have is over arms sales to Saudi Arabia. So it doesn't mean you have to cut off your arms relationship, but you could certainly limit certain types of weapons and sales, and they wouldn't want to go directly to other countries immediately because they need things like spare parts and training and all the rest. And so I, I think the U.S. Could, could actually lean into the Saudis more than they presently are um, without actually um, bearing threat of the Saudis to hurt the United States in a way that would be meaningful for our economy. Certainly, we're again, we're much more willing to risk the Chinese escalating on trade on the back of the tariffs that we've put on. We're much more willing to risk the Chinese the, the NAFTA relationship or the or the Europe trade relationship. Uh, we're not risking all that much with the Saudis given their size and their dependence and vulnerability. And the idea that, well, we should stick with them because they've been friends for such a long time, that's not carried weight with Trump with any of the other major allies. So why would it with Saudi Arabia? And I'm someone who, again, is fairly sympathetic to the U.S.-Saudi relationship, but I want to be honest with you people, right? Again, I think that that's where we get better policy discussions. All right, last question, and it's nice to see a young person here. Great to, it's great to see you. Um, do you have an opinion as to whether the world should have a country that acts as a global police? Well, that's a tough last question. Um, I mean, I really do believe that once, after World War II, the U.S., of course, didn't want to go in, wasn't going to go in despite Hitler, 
It was only after the U.S. was attacked on its homeland with Pearl Harbor that the U.S. decided. Remember, America first didn't start with Trump. America first started with Charles Lindbergh and a movement to keep the Americans out of the war. And the number of people that were killed and the amount of inhumanity that was wrought on human beings was enormous as a consequence of isolationism in the United States. And on the back of World War II, the Americans, the greatest generation, as we call them, set up the Marshall Plan to ensure that the Europeans would never have to go to war against each other again. We set up NATO. Um, we set up the United Nations with values that we believed actually mattered to try to help benefit humanity with a Declaration for Human Rights. Um, I think those were valuable things. But I also believe that if you live in a country where the average American feels like you aren't taking them care, care of them, you're at a problematic part of Maslow's triangle. You don't focus on self-actualization if you're focusing on your opioid addiction and no good job for you and no good opportunity for your kids. I'll tell you, my mom, when she was raising me and my brother, she had no problem with the idea of stealing from a corporation to, with a lot of money, big corporation, to ensure that we were taken care of. And, and she thought that was just fine. And, and again, I may think that was wrong, but I get it. I'm empathetic to it. And so I want to be, I believe that the United States, it would be good if the United States and countries like the U.S. played a greater role in providing global security, in supporting U.N. peacekeeping missions in countries where we don't have direct interests. Um, I think it'd be much better if we continue to, to lean into more humanitarian aid, Right, And if we support all these institutions. But I am deeply sympathetic to an awful lot of Americans that are saying America first because you haven't actually taken care of people back home. And until you do so, until you deal with the opioid ep epidemic, until you deal with the dislocations of new technologies and from globalization and free trade historically, that we are not going to support this stuff. I think that's really important. And so that makes your question so incredibly difficult to answer. And I'm really glad that you asked it. Ian Bremmer is the author of Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. He's the founder of the Eurasia Group. You can see his G Zero media show on WTTW and see his Twitter feed. It's always entertaining. It's been great to have you. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ian Bremmer. Worldview is produced by Steve Bynum and Julian Haida. Thanks to everybody here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for making things so easy and fun. Ian Whitaker, Elizabeth Williams, thanks a lot. I'm Jerome McDonald. You've been listening to Worldview on WBEZ.